northerly or northeasterly, backing northwesterly, three to five, occasionally six in the north. Rain or showers, good, occasionally four in the winter. Starting to Sussy Road, northeasterly, three or four, becoming very awkward in the west. Showers, moderate. Sussy Road to Limehouse, northeast, three to five, becoming very watery in the west. Fair, then showers, perhaps laundry, good, occasionally four. Line reaches to Land's End, a few yards of sea. Northerly or northwesterly, three to five, occasionally six near Land's End at first, becoming very often four. Then thundery showers, good, occasionally four. Land's End to Sir David's Head, we think of Bristol Channel. Northerly or northeasterly, three to five, occasionally six at first near west, becoming variable two to four later. Showers, perhaps thundery for a time, good, occasionally four. St David's Head to Great Ormhead, including St George's Channel. North or northeast, four or five, decreasing two or three later. Showers, good, Great Ormhead to Mullican. North or northwest, three to five, becoming variable, mainly northwest, two to four. Showers, good. Mile of Man. North or northwest, three or four, veering east later. Fair.
complaints made to the financial ombudsman about banking services at its highest level for a decade. The survey says concerns about current accounts, credit cards and scams have driven the increase from 18,000 to 80,000 in the past 12 months. The widow of the broadcaster and presenter Michael Mosley has said she is so proud of her husband's legacy in improving people's health. She's given her first interview since her husband died of natural causes after going missing on the Greek island of Sydney. She proceeded in tribute to Michael Mosley today by asking presenters and audiences to do just one thing to improve their well-being. Dr Claire Bailey Mosley told today that the public response had been extraordinary. It's been completely overwhelming. People really loved him. One of the sort of main things was that people felt they really knew him. I'm just so incredible that he has made such a difference. You know, I'm so proud of what he's done. Part of the M25 is to be shut again in both directions for the entire weekend. Junctions 10 to 11 of the motorway will be affected from tonight as a bridge is installed. It's the third of five scheduled closures before the end of the year. <coughs> Sarah Keith Lucas is back with today's weather. Thank you, Jane. Well, we've got a fair amount of cloud around for so much of the UK today. I think sunshine in fairly short supply and temperatures still a little below average for the time of the year for many of us, especially anywhere exposed to that northern breeze. So, southeast of England to start with, we've got some rain around first thing. That should gradually peel off towards the south and east. So, an improving picture here by the south to the east of a few brighter spells, particularly warm 18, possibly 19 degrees. Southwest of England, we'll see a day of sunny spells developing, but also a few sharp showers, particularly so around the south coast of Devon and Cornwall, and they'll drift towards the Channel Islands later in the day. But there'll be some brightness found elsewhere at minus 18. For the rest of England and Wales and Northern Ireland, we've really got a day of a lot of clouds around, but that's going to be producing some light and very patchy rain or drizzle at times. Some bright winds will be breaking through this afternoon. Temperatures close to the east coast, only about 14 or 15 normally flow, but further west, 17 or 18. For Scotland today, it's here that we'll see the lion's share of any sunshine, especially so through the central belt and some southern Scotland as well. Towards the north and northeast, it's going to be a little bit cloudy with a few spots of light rain, or quite a cool northerly breeze too. So if you're exposed to the breeze in the north, only about 13 or 14, but the southern belt of Scotland up to about 20 degrees. Into the weekend then, a fair amount of cloud on both days, I think, but the best of the sunshine will be in the south and the southwest. A few showers still lingering in the north of Lucas, thank you. Time now for a look at the papers. The Times is among those leading on the government's plans to release thousands of prisoners early. It described the move as a way to ease the crisis in the justice system after a warning from police chiefs that inaction could lead to a breakdown of law and order within weeks. It says the measure is only expected to apply to prisoners serving sentences of less than four years. The Daily Mail says Conservatives have blasted Labour's warnings about four prisoners as shameless scaremongering. Tory MP Neil O'Brien tells the paper, an idea we would be safer if lots of criminals were let out of jail is absolute nonsense. Daily Telegraph reports that the Energy Secretary will be able to talk and on another problem for the Prime Minister, who said to be facing a mutiny from his own backbenchers, who opposed the two-child benefit cap. It says some Labour MPs hope to bounce him into a concession by pushing for a King's speech vote on the matter next week. The Prime says the estimated cost of lifting the cap is between £2.5 and £3.6 billion. Pounds. The Daily Mirror front page has pictures of friends of the crossbow victims Carl Hunt and her daughters hugging each other at a vigil. 
with the headline, United in Grief. The three were killed at their home in Hertfordshire. The Daily Express is backing a campaign to ban the weapons, saying one of its reporters was able to buy one within minutes with no questions asked. The Financial Times has a story that the global population will shrink sooner than expected because of a plunge in fertility rates. According to a UN report, women from Italy and Spain to China and South Korea are having fewer babies, meaning that by the end of this century, the world will have 200 million fewer people than previous forecasts have predicted. The study says Europe's population will shrink by 21% from its 2020 peak, the largest decline in any continent. And the Metro looks ahead to the England football team's Euro 2024 final on Sunday. It picks up on the King's congratulations and is quick to avoid last minute drama in the final. Its headline uses some royal wordplay for the message May you reign over Spain. Now, business. The British artificial intelligence chip firm Graphcore has been bought by the Japanese investment firm SoftBank. Details from Monica Miller. The deal comes as the firm struggled to compete with the dominant AI chip company NVIDIA. SoftBank has not disclosed how much it paid, but it is thought to be considerably less than the £2 billion pounds the UK company was valued at after a financing round in 2020. The Graph Corps' chief executive, Nigel Toon, told the BBC the move wasn't about not being able to compete with the giants in the sector. What this deal does is give us access to a huge amount of investment and support to be able to continue to grow. The, the challenge is that AI has become so critical in so many places now, especially in the large hyperscales, that the amount of investment and the scale that you need to operate at is just enormous. An 11-day rise in Tesla shares came to a halt after news broke that the electric vehicle maker is delaying the unveiling of its robo-taxi. Its share price fell more than 8%. Tesla's chief, Elon Musk, had promised shareholders the delivery of its autonomous driving vehicle for years. The new release date is expected to take place in October, according to Bloomberg. Apple's Vision Pro is scheduled to go on sale in the UK for the first time today. The virtual reality headset starts at £3,499. It was first released in the US early in the year. But analysts say sales of Apple's first big product in years have gotten off to a slow start to the high price point. On the markets, in the city, the 100 share index ended the day up 30 points at 8,223. Last night on Wall Street, the Dow Jones closed 32 points higher at 39,754. On the currency markets, the pound is trading at $1.29.2 against the euro. Sterling is at 1 euro 18.8. That makes a euro worth 84.1 pence. Now in the roundup of the sporting action, here's Shabman Eunice Chu. We we'll start with cricket. England's men are on course for a huge win over West Indies in the first test at Lords. Day two saw James Anderson take two wickets in his final innings as an international bowler to help restrict the Windies to 79 for six. That's still 171 runs behind. While England women beat New Zealand by six wickets in Canterbury to secure their T20 series win, they've got a 3-0 lead in the five-match series. At Wimbledon, 70, Jasmine Paolini edged out Donna Vekic to become the first Italian to reach a women's singles final. Their three-set epic lasted almost three hours, making it the longest women's singles selling final at the tournament. Paolini will face Czech 31st seed Barbora Krachikova after she knocked out 2022 champion Elena Rabakina. Both will be playing in their first Wimbledon final. While Henry Patton reached his first Wimbledon men's doubles final by knocking out fellow Brits and 2023 champion Neil Skubsky. Finally, a glance back at some of the stories that make the news on this date in earlier years. In 2022, the four-time Olympic champions, Will Farah, revealed to the BBC that he was brought into the UK illegally under the name of another child. This time says he was taken away from his family in Somalia at the age of nine and forced to work for a family in West London. In 2013, on her 16th birthday, Manala Yousafzai addressed the United Nations and called for worldwide access to education. It was her first public speech since being shot in the head by Taliban militants in Pakistan for campaigning for female education. The ruling Synod of the Church of England decided to press ahead with the ordination of women bishops in 2010 after years of bitter debate. Reverend Rachel Weir from the lobby group Women in the Church said the decision was long overdue. 
Nobody can understand why it is it's taken us so long. I suppose the reason is for the, the best of reasons. We've wanted to keep out as many people on board as we can. Um, but it's still a huge, a huge momentous day and we're so pleased it's happened. In 1998, France won their first Football World Cup, beating Brazil 3-0 in Paris. US Surgeon General Roy Burney made the first official connection between smoking and lung cancer in 1957. On this day in 1794, Horatio Nelson lost the sight in his right eye at the siege of Calvi in Corsica. And in 1543, King Henry VIII married his sixth and last wife Catherine Parr in the ceremony at Hampton Court. He died four years later, and she outlived him. And that brings us to the end of this morning's news briefing. This is BBC Radio 4, and it's time for Prayer for the Day with Isha Smear in Rome. Good morning. As a first time mother, fully on board with the concept of gentle parenting. For me, it has a lot to do with trying to break the cycle of generational trauma caused by authoritarian parenting. While some have been cynical or called it the latest social media parenting trend, I would argue that gentle parenting is not a new parenting approach at all. In fact, there was someone else who practiced gentle parenting over 1,400 years ago. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was a major advocate of this parenting style. He was extremely affectionate and gentle with his children and compassionate and thoughtful towards their feelings. Anas ibn Malik was raised by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, like one of his own. Anas said of the Prophet, he never said to me, oof, a minor harsh word denoting impatience, and never blamed me by saying, why did you do so or why didn't you do so? The Prophet Muhammad not only set by example, but constantly encouraged his followers to be gentle and compassionate to their children, especially their daughters. In one famous saying, he is narrated to have said, whoever is merciful to their daughters will be granted heaven. While parenting, the Prophet Muhammad's reminders are always at the back of my mind. Our children have the right of receiving equal treatment as you have the right that they should honour you. So when it comes to gentle parenting, I don't need to look on social media. The Prophet Muhammad is a source of inspiration for me. I ask God the all compassion to enable me to be the patient, compassionate and emotionally intelligent parent that the Prophet Muhammad was. Amen. That was Prayer for the Day with Yusra Samir Imran. And now at a quarter to six, farming today with Anna Hill. Good morning. The Welsh Government responds to angry farmers who submitted their views on the new payment scheme, which emphasised environmental improvements. NFU Cymru tell us... Farmers do absolutely not shy away from responsibilities to the environment, biodiversity, climate change, all of those things. They are incredibly important. But the farmers also say they need a more balanced approach, which includes supporting food production. We'll have more on that in a moment. First though, this week we've been hearing how artificial intelligence can help farmers, from detecting disease in pigs to robot breeders in the fields. But it can also be a significant help to gauge the health of ecosystems. Newhurst Park in Hampshire is taking part in a project with the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology to use AI to monitor wildlife and find out how their farming practices could affect biodiversity. Marie Lemon met up with farm manager Gavin Pennell. So the site is 350 hectares. A lot of that is designated for landscape recovery, so for wildlife recovery. This section is designated as, as part of our agricultural projects, and this is five hectares. So nature recovery is a big part of it, but very important to us is that we are producing food off the land as well. We don't want to just take farmland out of production. We want to be doing our bit for nature, but then also producing for, for our local community as well. In the middle of this field, planted up for vegetables, is a bit of kit which, it's hoped, will boost Gavin's understanding of biodiversity on the land. It's a solar-powered monitoring station, essentially a small grey and white metal box on a waterproof sheet with a solar panel attached. My name is Jenna Lawson, I'm a biodiversity scientist at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. So we're looking at the AMI system, um, it stands for Automated Monitoring of Insects. The system monitors nighttime flying insects and then there's a motion activated camera here that every time it detects motion it takes pictures of the insects that are on the board. Along with images, it's gathering sounds like this. 24 hours a 
hours a day, seven days a week, which AI can then process and categorize. We can't manually sort through the levels of data that we're collecting these, with these machines. And so we use AI to process that data. With colleagues across, across the world, actually, we've been developing um, an AI system to identify moths to a species level. Uh, the AI program works in three levels. First, it detects an object, so then it draws a box around it, and then it detects, is it a moth or is it not a moth? If it's a moth, it will then go one step further and classify it to species, and then it will give us an Excel file with all the different species that it's classified, and also a confidence score of how sure it is that it's actually got it correct. For Gavin, this data can improve his understanding of what's on the land, and the impact his farming practices has on wildlife. And we knew what we wanted to do, and we knew what we wanted to achieve, but it's always been a bit of a grey area that we weren't really able to see the exact results that we would get. So it's hopefully going to validate some of the, the processes that we really have in place. But also, what we'd love it to do is guide us in the future. You know, we, we know that um, the way that we farm today is not necessarily the way that we're going to do it in a year's time, or 10 years' time. So hopefully, technology like this can guide us and keep us going in the direction that we want. What about the argument that by allowing tech and AI to identify wildlife, we're eroding a human connection to and understanding of what's around us? But we still we still need those experts. So we're these experts that know a lot about moths and a lot about bats. We need these people to, to label the data. So we can't do it without a human element. And actually, one of the things that we're utilizing is citizen science. So you'll see now there's a lot of apps out there where people can go and take a picture of something or record a sound that they hear. An AI on the app will tell them what that is. When people are doing that, what they're actually doing is they're feeding into these classifiers and these algorithms. So without the human element, we wouldn't be able to build classifiers like this because we're using that data to build this. There are around 30 of these systems on a variety of farms across the country. It's hopes the data will inform sustainable land management practices and policies. Maureen Lennon reporting. Now we've talked about growing meat in the lab before on this program, and now the Royal Agricultural University in Sirencester has published a report looking at the issue and its effect on farming. Later today, Radio Force of Rare Earth is Tom Heath and Helen Chesky is looking at the issue of Helen Pope and Coffee. Well, there are these ideas that I'm sure your listeners will have heard of, of culturing meat cells in a laboratory, and you know, meat cells of different types, and then either building them up into some kind of uh, meat-like thing, or just having a sort of meat slurry that can be used perhaps instead of mince, that kind of thing. The science is progressing, but it's not really hitting the mainstream just yet, but it's there and thereabouts. So we had a really interesting conversation with people who are working on that area, and people have been asking farmers about what they think about cultured meat. So there's a, a survey that is just out today that is asking what would cultivated meat mean for farmers, and it's based on the focus groups that we've done with farmers, and there are some really interesting opinions in there. So it's not just the science that's the developing, it's the attitudes towards it. We have been hearing for quite a few years now about cultured meat and about lab-grown meat, but how quickly are the changes happening? It's always hard to tell, isn't it, because it depends on so many things. So from a scientific point of view, the scientist on our programme, he thinks there could be some commercial products available within 10 years. And I think what that says is the technology might be ready within 10 years. But of course, the regulation and the social acceptance are quite different things. And there's also another aspect, isn't there, of meat generation, as it were because it's not just for food, is it? That's right, so interestingly, and I, I hadn't thought about this before, but of course, as soon as I'd seen the connection, it's quite obvious that a lot of the science that goes into cultured meat also has a relationship to the science for growing organs for medicine. So, you know, years ago, I went to visit someone building a human, uh, a, what could have been a replacement human heart on a, on a scaffold. The similarity is that you have to grow cells outside an animal, you have to grow them in a certain way, uh, and they have to be alive and reproduce. The difference is that if it's for medicine, you need it to be functional. So to a lot of the, the cutting edge technology is being done for potential future medicine, for perhaps organ transplants or skin transplants, something like that. Cultured meat worries farmers, doesn't it? And as you mentioned, the World Agricultural University has just done a study about farmer attitudes. How are farmers approached to this changing? I mean, do they 
Do they not want to know about it or are they interested? Well, the report was really interesting because what they did, they got groups of farmers together and they had discussions and allowed the debate to go on for some time. And of course, what came out was all the nuances. And actually, it turns out that the farmers they spoke to in a lot of cases were quite interested in all of this. You know, of course, there are the, the sort of concerns about is this proper food and, and how will this affect our livelihoods? But other farmers were seeing opportunities and they were saying, well, maybe there's things from our farms that we could sell into this process. Or maybe this will provide an extra source of income for us if it could be done locally <coughs> on our farm. And you can listen to Beth as Helen and Tom just after the midday news here on BBC Radio 4 and on BBC Sounds. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with the late broadcaster and Dr Michael Mosley. His Just One Thing series here at Radio 4 aimed to improve our health and well-being. And today Radio 4 is paying tribute to Michael throughout the day. Here's why. Michael Mosley was a wonderful broadcaster. He's, he's one of those voices we have in our head. I thought I knew him. His series, Just One Thing, really connected with me. Life can be a bit stressful, so if a doctor tells you there's a smorgasbord of just one thing you can do to help health and well-being, then I think is. I picked up on the advice to walk. It was something I could do and it's become a bit of a ritual. I don't just do the walk, I engage with it, at least I try to. I get what I call my radio ears on. I'm actively listening to the surrounding soundscape. The birds, the wind, the sense of where I am. It makes everything a bit more present and I can lose myself occasionally. There was one episode which really inspired me called Embrace the Rain. Michael Mosley said if you walk on a rainy day, you can improve your immune system. Rain releases special compounds in the soil. It's that wonderful earthy smell just after rain. Petrichor. It contains a chemical called geosmin, which is made by bacteria released into the air when the rain hits the soil. It's actually something I talked to a scientist about in one of our Farming Today programmes right here on the path I'm just walking now by the University of East Anglia. He'd been researching the smell of spring and had identified Rosemen as one of the components. I come out for a walk now most mornings and I do feel much better for it. So thank you, Michael Mosley, for inspiring me to try just one thing. And I still have your voice in my head. Now, agriculture is a devolved matter, so in Wales, the government there is responsible for designing the new policy which replaces old EU payments under the Common Agricultural Policy. You may remember that the plans for Wales, the Sustainable Farming Scheme, required farmers to put 10% of their land over to trees and 10% managed for wildlife habitats. Well, that caused massive protests by farmers who felt their job as food producers was being overlooked. The Welsh Government then opened up a consultation to hear the farmers' views in more detail and now the Welsh Government has just published its response. I asked Abby Reader, NFU Cymru Deputy President, what the Welsh Government had said. Well, the key thing for people to understand is it is a collation of the responses. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be any answers in there, so some people might find that quite frustrating. I mean, really what it's saying is that the response, particularly from farmers, were showing their dismay and their anger at the perceived complexity of the scheme. And just to explain, you know, some of those steps that they were asking farmers to take were to plant significant numbers of trees on their land, so that they'd have 10% of their land in trees. They would also have 10% of their land in management for habitat for wildlife. So do you think now that the Welsh Government has heard what the farmers really thought about those plans, that there might be an announcement soon about some changes? Well, there won't be much of an announcement until the results from the round table and from the carbon sequestration evidence review panel have come forward. So with regards to the cold hard facts and details of what the scheme is going to look like, that is still some way off. And it's really good news that the Cabinet Secretary, Eurac David, has delayed 
the implementation of this scheme for another year to allow these decisions to be made and make sure that they can properly reflect what was heard in response to those consultations. It's interesting, isn't it? Do you think that the appointment of Hugh Ranker Davis actually has made a difference? The Labour run government of Wales hasn't changed, but the people within the system, that has changed, hasn't it? Yes, I mean, what we've seen is Hugh Ranker Davis willing to come to the table to discuss the issues. Farmers do absolutely not shy away from responsibilities to the environment, biodiversity, climate change. All of those things, they are incredibly important. But what we want is a scheme that will deliver at least as good a benefit for farming businesses as the current scheme, which I don't think is too big an ask. And last year at the Royal Welsh Show, I was there and I remember the then Rural Affairs Secretary saying, Leslie Griffiths saying to me that they were really worried because they weren't clear how much money they were getting from Westminster to put all of this into operation. Now there's a Labour government in Westminster, does that change things as well? Well, you'd like to think that it would change things. Now that we've got a UK government that is, is the same colour as Welsh government, then hopefully that means they can have clearer dialogue, more constant dialogue and, and a better understanding of what's going on. We want a cabinet secretary who is able to go to Westminster <coughs> and fight our corner and say, this is why we need this pot of money, this is what it's going to deliver for the benefit of Wales and the benefit of the UK. This is our strategy and everybody's behind it and we need your support now to make sure we can get the right funding. Happy reader from NLP Cymru. That's all from us today. I'm Anna Hill, the producer for BBC Audio Bristol. What's that on the beach? On Monday morning on Radio 4, Natalie Haynes presents Ancient History with a Modern Twist. On BBC Radio 4. Cleopatra was born closer in time to the building of the Eiffel Tower than the pyramids at Giza. Oh, we love the facts, don't we? <laughs> a fresh take on the ancient world from the comedian and classicist Nasty Haynes. Cleopatra's family tree is basically 47 men who are all called Ptolemy. <laughs> I am simply not joking. Natalie Haynes stands up for the classics. Only Cicero would take offence because an actual Egyptian queen wasn't impressed enough by him. Last <laughs> night on BBC Sounds and Radio 4. It's six o'clock on Friday, the 12th of July. This is today with Justin Webb and the whole watch. And nice this morning. President Biden has used his first solo news conference in months to stress his fitness for office. But some of his answers simply gave his critics further ammunition. What concerns do you have about Vice President Harris's ability to beat Donald Trump if she were at the top of the table? Look, I wouldn't have picked Vice President Trump to be Vice President. But I think she's not qualified to be president. The government will announce emergency measures to free up space in prisons in England and Wales. And also in today's programme, it's just one thin day on Radio 4, a celebration of the life and legacy of Dr. Michael Wells. We don't care about the extraordinary actions of the UK's government. It's been completely overwhelming. People really loved him. People felt they really knew him, that they lived in his kitchen and knew what he was cooking. It was, it was very sort of trusting and kind of weirdly intimate. Plus, this ignorance really something bad thing. We'll be talking to the former MP now, podcaster Roy Stewart, about the role that ignorance has played in the pursuit of knowledge. Scientists returned to the wreck of the Titanic for the first time since Titan submersible disaster, but uh, this time it will be robots. Dive and it's a big weekend for sport and counting butterflies. President Biden has insisted he remains mentally sharp enough to run for re election, despite mistakenly introducing Ukraine's leader as President Putin at a NATO summit in Washington before correcting himself. A subsequent news conference, his first without a script in eight months, made a defiant defense of his candidacy and a further gap. Our North American editor, Sarah Smith, was listening. It was an unfortunate start to an event at which President Biden was under intense scrutiny and he got the name of his own Vice President, Kamala Harris, wrong. I wouldn't have picked Vice President Trump to be Vice President, but I think she's not qualified to be President. 
area of world leaders at the NATO summit who cringed when Mr. Biden introduced the key European ally as his sworn in. And now I want to hand over to the president of Ukraine, who has as much courage as he has determination. Ladies and gentlemen, President Putin. President Putin. He's a big president of Putin. President Zelensky. I'm so focused on beating Putin, we are not to worry about it. Anyway. However, these recent lines only from his mistake. Over the past 21 hour in his home script of news conference, he constantly discussed the conflicts in Ukraine and Gaza, as well as economic policy and his own election prospects, stressing to reporters the virtues of his age and experience. The only thing age does is help you create a little bit of wisdom that you pay attention to. He made it clear he had no intention of pulling out of the presidential race, despite repeated questions about his fitness for office. And there was nothing in this performance that would force him to change his mind. But after the event, more members of Congress said they thought he should step aside, indicating this issue will continue to dog Mr. Biden as he campaigns for a win. President Zelensky cancelled a planned news conference in the wake of Joe Biden's gaffe at the NATO summit. The French President Emmanuel Macron said it had been a slip of the tongue and insisted his American counterpart had been on top of matters at the gathering. Sakir Starmer was asked about the blunder by our political editor Chris Mason. Is it not reasonable that some might feel anxious and might feel scared in the presence of the United States when they make a bigger NATO, more countries. We have a stronger NATO. The present might have led to all of that. The Justice Secretary, Shaban Mahmood, will today announce emergency measures to deal with the lack of space in prisons in England and Wales. Sakia Starmer has described the problem as unforgivable and worse than he thought. Is our senior UK correspondent, Sina Gitech. Shaban Mahmood is expected to talk about overcrowding in jails and what must be done to stop the system collapsing. She'll spell out the measures the government plan to take, including releasing some inmates after they've completed 40% of their sentence to free up space. The senior prison source says there are 700 spaces left in male prisons in England and Wales. I understand for the system to operate smoothly and effectively, there needs to be a minimum of just over 1,400 free spaces. Whether Shabana Mahmood's plan works could be an early mark of the new government's success. The most senior legal advisor to the Welsh government has accused Downing Street of orchestrating the day of the miners' strike in 1984 when Robert Thatcher was Prime Minister. The Council General for Wales, Nick Antonov, represented miners who were arrested in Orkney when he was a young solicitor, has called on the new government of Westminster to honour its manifesto commitment and an inquiry into the clashes at the South Yorkshire Petting Plant, which had more than 100 miners and police officers injured. Spokesperson said there was no detailed information to share yet. The British tech firm Graphcorp, which specialises in developing artificial intelligence chips, has been bought by the Japanese company SoftBank. The price tag has been revealed. Graphcorp is said to be worth a fraction of the £2.8 billion it was valued at in 2020. The chief executive of Graphcorp, Nigel Toon, said the company's headquarters would stay in Bristol if they in charge. What this deal does is give us access to you know, a huge amount of investment and support to be able to continue to grow. The, the challenge is that AI has become so critical in so many places now, especially in the large hyperscales, that the, the amount of investment and the scale that you need to operate at is, is just enormous. Part of the M25 between junctions 10 and 11 will shut tonight for the weekend. It's the third closure of five planned for this year, as part of work to build a new bridge at junction 10 near Wisley in South. Jane, thank you very much indeed. Six minutes past six, let's go over to Sarah Keith. This has got the weather for us. Hi, Sarah. Hi, good morning, Fairly cloudy, grey sort of day out there for most of us. Today, bits and bobs of patchy light rain and drizzle around, but certainly not a, a lot of washouts on the day. A fairly cool north wind breeze, especially from the east. So, for the southeast of England, we start the day with more persistent rain. That will fade away as we head towards lunchtime, and by the afternoon, some brighter spells just trying to break through. Temperatures up to about 19 degrees here. Into the southwest of England, 
at least start with a few spots of light rain. It can brighten up though, there'll be some sunshine, but also a few heavy thundery showers in southern parts of Cornwall, Devon, towards the Channel Islands as well, by temperatures 17 or 18. For the rest of England, away from the south, and Wales and Northern Ireland, we're expecting a lot of cloud and that's going to produce on and off patchy light drizzly rain at times. Best of the brightness will be further west, I think, later on in the afternoon. If you're closer to the east coast, it stays a bit murky, only 14 or 15 here, but around 18 further west. For Scotland today, a fairly cloudy start, some outbreaks of rain in the northwest, but actually some brighter, drier weather developing, particularly through the central belt, parts of southern Scotland as well. Here we'll see temperatures at about 20 degrees. But in the north and northeast, where you'll spread that breeze, I think about 14 or 15. Into the weekend, then, best of the sunshine will be generally towards the south, cloudier in the north, but things will gradually warm up over the next couple of days. Uh, Sarah, thank you. Eight minutes past six is the time. So our first look at the papers. The Times among those leading the government's plans to release thousands of prisoners early describes the move as a way to ease the crisis in the justice system after warning from police chiefs that inaction could lead to a breakdown of law and order within weeks. It says the measure is only expected to apply to prisoners serving sentences of less than four years. The Mail says Conservatives have blasted Labour's warnings about poor prisons as Shameless scaremongering, the Tory MP Neil O'Brien tells the paper the idea would be safer if lots of criminals were let out of jail is absolute nonsense. So Keir Starmer is on a collision course with unions, according to the Guardian. It says the Prime Minister has played down the chance of real terms pay increases for public sector staff, prompting warnings of a crisis in recruitment and staffing. It adds that while number 10 isn't ruling out some settlements above inflation, so Keir said the unions wouldn't get everything they wanted and that finances were in a very poor state. The I reports on another problem for the Prime Minister who said to be facing mutiny from his own back benches who opposed the two-child benefit cap. It says some Labour MPs hope to bounce him into a concession by pushing for a King's Speech vote on the matter next week. The I says the estimated cost of lifting the cap is between 2.5 and 3.6 billion pounds. The Daily Mirror front page carries pictures of friends of the crossbow victims Carol Hunt and her daughters hugging each other at a vigil with the headline United in Grief. The pair were killed at their home in Hertfordshire. They expressed a backing campaign to ban the weapons, saying one of its reporters were able to buy was able to buy one within minutes uh, with no questions asked. The Financial Times says the global population is going to shrink sooner than expected because of a plunge in fertility rates. According to a UN report, women from Italy and Spain to China and South Korea are having fewer babies. By the end of the century, the world will have 200 million fewer people than previous forecasts have predicted. The study says Europe's population will shrink by 21% from its 2020 peak, the largest decline in any country. And the Metro looks ahead to the England Football Team's Euro 2024 final on Sunday. It picks up on the King's congratulations and is quick to avoid last minute drama in the final. It's headline uses some raw wordplay for the message main rain over Spain. Get it? Ten past six is the time. Joe Biden's held a news conference at the end of the NATO summit for Washington. Did it do enough to convince America that he should remain the Democrats' candidate for the presidency? Jenny Kumar is our Washington correspondent. She was watching. I think at the beginning there were moments when his voice sounded hoarse and coughed a few times. There was that mix-up right at the start. He said Vice President Trump instead of Vice President Harris. That came soon after the embarrassing gaffe of calling President Zelensky. President Putin. Uh, but overall, I think he was pretty coherent, talking for over an hour. He filled with a series of questions about his mental fitness to do the job. He smiled, laughed, made jokes despite the difficult questions. And I think you could say he had the demeanour of a seasoned political operator. At times, it's clear he was using the political stage, the moment, uh, the big boy conference, to speak directly to voters, highlighting the success of the NATO summit, his foreign policy, his domestic achievements. But some may say that there was a low bar. He was looking presidential, staying on message, making sense, but that's quite a low bar for him to pass. The question is, you know, was this enough uh, to stem the flow of people in his own party who were thinking uh, should he should step aside. And that is now quite a flip. I think his team were hoping that the NATO summit would help move things along, but that hasn't been the case in the last few days. There's been some high profile people coming out um, and saying he should stand down. And since the debate, there's been a bit of reaction. Uh, so, for example, soon after the debate, another Democrat, a Californian congressman, 
uh, Scott Peters came out publicly to raise concerns uh, about Biden continuing as the presidential candidate. And the media here are reporting that more could come out publicly in coming days. Uh, but then, you know, we have, we've had another senior Democrat, Jamie Harrison, saying that people should stop nitpicking over his gaps and move on. So, you know, the message continues to be from President Biden that he's going to continue. He's the best person to go up against Trump. The needs of the continues, and that is suitability to stand. And all this is happening just in months, uh, just a few weeks, really, until the general election. So it's less than an ideal situation for the Democrats to be in. Jenny Cooper in Washington. Thank you. To Wales, minutes past six, a curious story in Wales because a Welsh news website has said that a former Welsh government minister was not its source for a story that subsequently got her sacked for leaking messages to the media. It all sounds um, rather a uh, Kremlin monge, but in fact it's happening in Wales. And Hal Griffin, uh, Wales correspondent in Cardiff, can unpack it for us. Hal, uh, what's going on? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, well, this goes back to May and the sacking of Hannah Blythin, a Labour Party member and a Welsh Government Minister for Social Partnerships until then. She was accused of being the source of a leak of a phone image, so a screen grab effectively from a mobile phone, and messages going back to August 2020 that showed Vaughan Gething, then the Health Minister Wales during the pandemic, suggesting he would delete messages from that group in case a freedom of information request came in. Now, that image appeared on this website, Nation Cymru, in May, and within a day or two, she lost her job. She insisted then, as she does now, that she wasn't the source of the leak. She was absent from the Senate for several weeks. She came back and made a statement on Tuesday, insisting she was innocent. And then, the following day, she sat there shaking her head as Vaughan Gething explained that there was evidence to show that the leak had come from her. Uh, the latest twist in the tape said late yesterday afternoon the website that published all this nation company took the quite rare step that journalists we don't like talking about revealing our sources but they said that she wasn't the source of the leak so it's left us in the quite a bizarre standoff in a way with her insisting she's innocent for getting insisting that the leak came from her phone and let's specify from her phone not necessarily directly from her but this is all within the Welsh Labour government at a time when, well, you'd imagine they'd be celebrating Labour's success in the general election or getting on with tackling issues like uh, the time to steal crisis or long waiting lists in Wales. Yeah, I mean, it's strange story, as you say, uh, I don't usually talk about sources as, as journalists, but if it is shown to be the case that Hannah Blythin was not the source, even if their story came from her phone, how much trouble could Vaughan Ketting be in? Because it's quite a, um, it's quite a serious accusation it's made. It's hard to see how he could manoeuvre backwards out of it. I think potentially the stress that it was her phone, even if it wasn't her directly, would be the only avenue. But what it, it does do is increase the personal pressure on him. We've spoken several times over the last few months about the loss of confidence in him, his acceptance of a donation, uh, £200,000 for his leadership campaign from a company where there's conviction for illegally dumping waste. We know there was a Labour group meeting yesterday planned a way then that probably should have been a bit more celebratory where people will have been talking do they have confidence is this the person who could lead them into the next welsh election 2026 so that pressure incrementally going back again on board getting in what probably should have been quite a good week for him considering the result of his party had a week ago Carl Griffith in Cardiff. Thank you. 16 minutes past six is the time. The FT's main headline this morning is Sterling surges as GDP data buoys Labour's growth agenda. Let us talk a bit about Sterling and indeed the rest of the business news that comes this morning from Felicity. Good morning, Felicity. Good morning, yes. Uh, so this, this surge came after data that showed the UK's GDP rose by 0.4% in May, and that was twice what had been expected by analysts. So that particular growth was fueled by services, by house building. Let's talk to Anna McDonald, independent, uh, independent equity analyst based in Edinburgh. Anna, good morning. Good morning. Wait, the pound rose against a number of other currencies, and we also saw the US dollar fall. Which was most important for this, this surge against the dollar, and why did we see that move? Uh, we 
we saw the US dollar weaken because the US inflation numbers that came out showed that um, inflation, including the core inflation number, which is something that the Fed looks at very closely, um, it showed that inflation slowed more than expected. So that meant that um, we um, thought that the um, Federal Reserve might be more likely to cut interest rates. And so that would have served to weaken the dollar. And as you've already explained, there was that double whammy of, of good US UK growth numbers um, that possibly mean that our interest rates aren't going to be cut in the near future, which just makes the, the it more attractive to put your money into into pounds where you can order, uh, gain a, a higher interest rate. Mm, thank you. Um, let's talk about the British uh, AI chip firm Graphical, which was once seen as a possible rival to the market leader NVIDIA. That's now been bought by a Japanese conglomerate, the SoftBank. Now, we don't know how much SoftBank paid. There is a pretty widely held belief it's going to be a lot less than the two billion pounds the company was worth in 2020. Yes, at, at, at one stage, yes, this was a uh, two billion uh, valuation according to um, sources, and they had uh, quite a roster of investors, um, even Microsoft as an early investor. But uh, fortunes did start to change, and they actually had falling revenues. And uh, revenues, I think, in 2022 of only 2.7 million. I mean, that compares rather poorly with against Nvidia's 70 billion or something like that. So um, they fought fallen revenues, and they just haven't been able to to keep up as Nvidia chips have been so sought after by hyperscalers. I think the the, the sale value is around 500 million, which is actually less than the amount of money that's been put into the company so far. And briefly, that SoftBank already bought up the British chip designer ARM. Is this move now going to be a blow to UK financial markets? I think Graphcore is, um, it, it didn't quite have the dominance of ARM. ARM uh, well, designs the chips that go into the vast majority of the world's handsets, uh, mobile handsets. So a slightly different being. Um, Obviously, it's not, it's not great to, to see another company um, lost to, to an overseas investor, um, but I think quite a, different, a quite a different scale of company. Anna McDonald, thank you very much indeed. Now, there are concerns over the future of financial support schemes that are designed to encourage young businesses to grow. The Enterprise Investment Scheme and its sister program, the C Enterprise Investment Schemes, names, offer tax relief to investors, and that helps funnel money towards growing often knowledge-based businesses. The EIS hit its 30th anniversary earlier this year. It's been credited with providing over £23 billion pounds in investment that helps businesses start up and then scale. It could now come to an end, business experts are warning, if the EU doesn't approve an extension of both these schemes. Let's talk to Joanna Jensen, who's chairwoman of the Enterprise Investment Scheme Association, which is the trade body for the EIS. Uh, and Joanna, also the founder of the child-sensitive skincare brand, Child's Farm. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us. How important are these schemes? Oh, they're absolutely vital if you're a small startup business or an SME because they give you investment money that you otherwise wouldn't be able to achieve because of the wonderful tax incentives around this scheme. And this is really EIS we're talking about now, um, which you know, in the last 12 months generated two billion pounds worth of investment. So this is a significant sum of money that's at risk. Mm, and money that you used yourself to grow child's farm. Absolutely, I had three rounds of EIS with my business, and without that, I wouldn't have been able to attract the angel investment investors who supported me through my growth. Because for them, it gives them very, very attractive tax rebates, thirty percent income tax relief in the year that they make the investment. And of course, if they hold that investment for longer than three years, and fingers crossed that investment is successful. Any dividends, any and anything that they make out of that business is CGT free. So it's a fantastic incentive, not only for angel investors but venture capital trusts and other groups of investors. So why do you think these schemes are not risk? Well, in 2015, the EU decided that the EIS was actually state aid and that they insisted something called a sunset clause, so an end date was put to the scheme, so it would then have to be renewed. Now that end date is the 5th of April next year. Now, earlier this year, the government um, did an amendment to the Finance Act, and that said, yes, we are going to renew that for another 10 years. However, 
the EU is supposedly meant to approve this extension and that is yet to be done and that even though the Treasury has said you know we're talking to them it's in an advanced stage that is as much as we're hearing mm. so in nine months till D-Day as it were it's very hard particularly for VCT so it's venture capital trust schemes to create new funds which those funds would invest maybe in 10 12 15 new businesses usually at startup stage usually at a central growth stage it's very hard for them to launch new funds not knowing whether or not this is going to be approved it is just a simple treasury order that is required well uh, a treasury spokesperson uh, told us we're a government of wealth creation and are committed to supporting startups to raise the capital they need to invest and grow our economy the processes to extend the enterprise investment scheme are at an advanced stage and we'll continue to ensure the uk is the best place to start the business uh, very very briefly joanna do you feel reassured that it is going to get that approval of the line I hope it does. I mean, the, the, from what the new government is saying, they sound extraordinarily supportive of business. And I would cite actually Tulip Sadiq, who back in January at the reading of this proposed renewal, absolutely stood out there and said, not only does it need to be renewed, but actually this renewal process needs to be scrapped. It should be here in perpetuity for us. Joanna Jensen, Chairwoman of the Enterprise Investment Scheme Association. Thank you very much indeed. Now, there's one, really only one big story in town this weekend, for England fans at least, it's the final uh, on Sunday. It is also a massive business event as well, got people rushing to buy beer, barbecue bits, bunting, and of course shirts. What are your chances of getting an England shirt before the final? Well, Chris darcy Burt should be able to tell you. He's Vice President of the global sportswear giant Fanatics, which is the official retail partner for England. Chris, good morning. Good morning. First of all then, uh, how much of a difference does it make to sales of merchandise for England to get as far as they have? Yeah, um, it, it makes a huge difference, you know, um, across the, the Fanatics network, which includes that official England FA store. Um, it, England's having the best selling tournament um, ever, uh, for sure, sales. Wow. Are other people, maybe late covers to the excitement, people who've only just got uh, on the excitement bus, are they rushing to buy merch this weekend? And can you get it to them in time? Yeah, um, we are definitely seeing a, a late spike um, Wednesday. Uh, the semi-finals are our best-selling day for England merchandising and one of our best-selling hours uh, after the semi-final whistle. Um, we have left it quite late now <laughs> to buy online for, for delivery, uh, particularly uh, if you wanted a, a player's name and number on your on your shirt, which you know many of our fans do. Uh, they're handmade in Manchester, um, so it would take uh, a lot, likely a little bit longer, but you definitely have something to, to celebrate, hopefully, uh, early next week. Hopefully everybody will still be wanting to wear the shirt next week. Um, you, never yeah. know, though. you never know who's going to do well in a tournament. So when, let's say, Ollie Watkins becomes a national hero overnight, do you have the stock in stock to reflect that? Yeah, there's always a huge spike. Um, you know, we work with over 900 sports partners, so we see it with every uh, major tournament, whether that's the World Cup, Champions League, or the Super Bowl. Um, we uh, we don't always uh, have you know, you know, stock in, 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 in place all the time at, at the period, but we don't actually need to um, because we can operate on a super uh, uh, agility, um, super quick um, uh, in, um, <laughs> Yeah. You can turn, you can turn <laughs> it around quickly, I suppose that's the, that's the business that you're in. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we operate on an MTO basis, which is made to order, so we can quickly uh, jump into action um, as soon as the final goes, the final whistle goes, we can get um, great uh, officially licensed merchandise to fans very, very quickly. Now, if England had gone out earlier then, would you have had lots of excess merchandise, uh, or what does this kind of manufacturing as you go guard you against that? Yeah, exactly. Um, manufacturing as we go uh, guards against that to an extent. Um, our team have planned and anticipated that England uh, will do quite well in this tournament, but uh, that, that agility allows us to, to protect ourselves from that, from that scenario. How popular are we around the world? Are you selling many England shirts internationally? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so far this year, we've actually shipped um, official England merchandise to over 92 countries. Um, the, the biggest destinations outside of England are, are actually the USA, uh, Australia, and Canada. 
Well, it's good to know that, uh, that some other, other countries cheering us on. Um, there are, of course, loads of counterfeit shirts on sale, and those shirts are undeniably at much cheaper prices than the official products. Does that look fresh on uh, yeah, counterfeit is, is absolutely an issue. Um, sometimes it is price driven. Um, and the way we tackle here at Fanatics is by offering a really wide range of official products at different price points. So we have over uh, 700 uh, officially licensed England products available in the FA store. And with uh, you know, official retro kits, they actually start at mm -hmm. £25. So it's a really good, really good price point. Um, there's, there's a lot of benefits to fans in, in buying an officially licensed product rather than a fake product. So you know where the product is made and sourced, uh, you know that there are fair working conditions, uh, that you're going to get a quality product and uh, you, can have, you can return it if you're unhappy or you can change a size. Uh, and actually, you know, fans heading to Berlin this weekend should look out for the Fatix fan because we're, we're running an amnesty where if you have a fake kit, you can actually swap it for the real thing. Okay, uh, well, Chris, I'm sure lots of people will be going late into work on Monday, but probably not you by the sounds of it. Chris Darcy Burt, uh, Vice President of Fanatics, thank you very much indeed. Felice, thank you very much indeed. We'll speak to you after 7 o'clock, but now at 27 minutes past 6, we um that time of year when Carthy seems to disappear, but she's actually working extremely hard at Wimbledon. And that's where you are this morning, Carthy. It is, it is. And yeah, I don't expect anyone to feel sorry for me for long hours at all when I'm sitting on centre court at Wimbledon. But let's talk about cricket first because in his last test match as an international bowler, Jimmy Anderson took two wickets to help put in the John Paul's victory over West Indies in the first test at Laws. Moves to cricket correspondent John Fernandy reports. It's been a very one-sided match, so the West Indies completely outplayed. Lack of preparation hasn't helped, but it's a very inexperienced team that needs to gain something that they can take with them to Trent Bridge next week. Anderson could still finish his career with a five-wicket haul. He's taken two so far, with four still to fall, and just the West Indies bowlers to come. It's been a near-perfect performance by England. Runs for every batsman, apart from Duckett and Stokes. Impressive seven-wicket haul for Atkinson, and Smith has also had a very encouraging debut. He kept wicket tidily on a notoriously difficult ground, and his 17 was an innings of two halves, in which he showed his naturally attacking instinct when batting with the tail enders. He's trailed by 171 runs, they three starts in 11 for the Five sports extra at the BBC Sports Website. Female women beat New Zealand by six wickets to take an unsaleable 3 0 lead in the final match to 20 series. As you can see, they had an unbeaten 67 in the third to the first match. After a heartbreaking US Open, Rory McIlroy shot an opening day 5 under 65. As he starts the defence of the Scottish Open title, World number 2 didn't feel under pressure. It was nice to be out there. I think as well, great to be out there with Bob and, and with Victor. Um, you know, two people I'm really comfortable with and familiar with, and then you know, to have the crowd following us as well. It was, it was a nice reintroduction to, to competitive golf, and nice to be inside the ropes again for sure. America's Justin Thomas is top of the leaderboard with an eight and a par round of 62. The 2021 French Open champion Barbara Kvitschikova will play the seventh seed. Jasmine Paolini from Italy in the women's singles final at Wimbledon tomorrow. After they won their semi finals, and today it is men's singles semi finals day. Novak Djokovic will face 22 year old Lorenzo Zetti this afternoon, and the 24 time Grand Slam champion has had a relaxed build up to the match. Having a family here is, is a blessing for me, so it's not just my favourite tournament since I was a child, but it's also their favourite tournament because they get to have, you know, courts to hit on. And Wimbledon is very nice to you know, allow my children to be around. And it's great because it you know, releases some of that pressure and tension that is building up when you support at the end of the tournament. We also have the defending champion Carlos Alcraft up against the fifth seed, Daniel Medvedev. Alcraft looking to win back to back Grand Slam titles off winning the French Open just six weeks ago, and that is very, very difficult to do. Alcraft, uh, we'll take that from you. Thank you. What will your summer sound like when you hear the flute melody? It's telling a beautiful story. Just listen to their fancy. Glorious. The sound of that ace as it came off the bracket. With the BBC Sounds app, you can take all of this with you wherever you go. Pause and rewind live radio and listen to your favourite music mixes and podcasts all in one place. Don't miss a thing this summer. Download the BBC Sounds app. Now the time is 29 minutes to 7. You're listening to today on BBC Radio 4 with Justin Webb and Amal Raj. Here's a summary of the news from Jade Steve.
President Biden has insisted he remains the most qualified candidate to take on Donald Trump in November's US election, despite making two major mistakes in news conferences overnight. The 81-year-old mistakenly called the Ukrainian leader, President Putin, during an event and not the end of the NATO summit in Washington, before referring to his deputy, Kamala Harris, and Vice President Trump when taking questions from reporters at a separate event. He went on to make clear he had no intention of dropping out of the race for the White House, saying age had provided him with wisdom. Mr. Keir Starmer defended the president at his news conference in Washington, insisting that Mr. Biden should be given credit for a successful NATO summit. The Prime Minister said critics of the president should look at the substance of what had been achieved over the past two days. The government will today set out plans to release some prisoners early in an effort to free up spaces in jails in England and Wales. The Justice Secretary, Shafan Mahmood, has said emergency measures are needed to pull the justice system back from the brink of total collapse. Those released early are expected to have served 40% rather than 50% of their sentence. The most senior legal advisor to the Welsh Government has accused Downing Street of orchestrating the bloodiest day of the miners' strike. Council General for Wales, Nick Antonyev, is calling on the new government of Westminster to honour its manifesto commitment to hold an inquiry into clashes between miners and the police at the Orkney coking plant in South Yorkshire in 1984. The government spokesperson said there was no detailed information to share yet. The British tech firm Graphcore, which makes chips for artificial intelligence, has been bought by the Japanese company SoftBank. The size of the deal hasn't been revealed. Or says its headquarters will remain in Bristol. Part of the M25 between junctions 10 and 11 will shut tonight for the weekend. The third closure of five planned for this year with what have worked over the new bridge at junction 10 near Wisley in Surrey. Jane, thank you very much indeed. 27 minutes to 7. The story that's really dominating UK politics this week is all about prisons and justice. It's probably the front pages as well, actually. And Justice Secretary Shabana Mahmood is giving a speech today that aims to address what is happening in Britain's prisons. Uh, Seema Katecha is our senior UK correspondent who joins us now. Uh, Seema, morning. Uh, what is happening in our prisons and what will the uh, Justice Secretary be saying and doing about it later today? Morning. Um, yeah, we've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks, haven't we? But I've been speaking to people working in prisons from Fox. And the picture there today is chaos um, and overcrowding. For example, I have a story to speak to each of the ones where they recently told me that they're putting in bays in cells where toilets aren't working properly. So there are overflowing toilets. But because they have nowhere to put in bays, they're putting them in the non-operational cells like that one. So um, the Justice Secretary, Siobhan Mahmood, uh, is visiting two prisons today, H of the Bedford and H of the Five Wells. And the idea is, I understand, to see up close the true extent of overcrowding. Once this visit's over, she's going to give a speech where she'll announce some of the emergency measures that the government's taking. So we've been hearing a lot about the release of some offenders, some offenders on non-determinate non sentences, should I say, who finish 40% of their sentence. And these are likely to include people um, who've done, who are doing time with things like drug offences uh, and shoplifting, not rapists and murderers. Um, but um, all, it's important to say that, you know, the figures that I'm hearing at the moment, the senior prison sources told me there are fewer than 700 spaces left in male jails. And I understand there should be at least 1,400 free spaces for the system to operate effectively. So there's a real sense of urgency here from people like the Prisons uh, Governors Association, Prison Officers Association, all the people working on part of the legal system, saying that if we don't do something now, in a matter of days, this system could be a bursting point. So the government really needs to show that it's on the wall here and, and take that urgent action, or as I said, the warnings and the dire for people who won't be at the heart of the system. Yeah, we're going to hear some of those warnings again at uh, eight, uh, 10 to 8 on this programme. But for now, see you in Good to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Four minutes to seven is the intense fighting in Gaza, focused on the biggest city, Gaza City. Let's talk to Roshki Rafjaru, who is uh, the BBC Facilities Gaza correspondent, who is in Istanbul uh, at, at the moment. Roshki, tell us what you know about what's been happening in Gaza City. Yeah, good morning. I mean, very good. It seems this morning as the uh, Israeli tanks were reported to be withdrawn from the 
the western part of the city after like uh, ground troops were involved in a military operation for the last 48 hours and they have issued a, a warning to all the workers to, to leave so the confusion and the chaotic for the people because they don't know exactly if that the order is still valid or it's over because of the tanks that were drawn from the area many people try to return back to uh, their homes to, to check on them the very limited uh, uh, resource, very limited crews, uh, uh, rescue teams try to reach the, the area and check. There was a lot of reports about uh, bodies were in the streets and people were, were killed in some of the uh, building. The area witnessed a very heavy fighting uh, for about 48 40, 40 hours. You know, the Israeli army said that they are they were in this area to uh, uh, dismantle some of the military capability for Hamas, especially they said it's in the uh, in the UN uh, compound in the western uh, side of the of the city. Last night there was also very intense airstrikes. Uh, and what's the bigger picture? Mostly when it comes to talks about a, a ceasefire and indeed talks about what happens in Gaza after that ceasefire. Yeah, you know, there was the, uh, the Israeli delegation in Doha uh, for about six, seven hours. They conducted meetings with the uh, two main mediators, the Qataris and the Egyptian. Also, the, uh, the Americans are involved. Yesterday, also. There was talks in uh, Cairo, but doesn't seem that the talk either in Cairo or in Doha so far have managed to achieve significant breakthrough into the uh, this uh, ongoing negotiation for a, a very long time. The Hamas uh, uh, leaders, issue, uh, Hamas senior leaders, told the BBC this morning that we showed maximum flexibility, but he said Mr. Netanyahu doesn't want this deal to, to go ahead because of personal uh, uh, interest when him they said Hamas can give up this uh, uh, precondition that the uh, guarantee to end the war should be included in the deal and we are very, uh, very uh, flexible about it but it's in the Israeli board uh, the board is in the Israeli borders for Hamas if they are not sure if the talks will be resumed today or not but we know that some sort, some sort of some level of initiation in Cairo and the Hamas territory Okay, Rushdie and Thank you very much. 21 minutes to 7, Avon and Somerset police have launched a man of two suitcases containing human remains were found on Clifton Suspension Bridge. They've released the pictures of a suspect in the case. Uh, a black man with a beard dressed all in black with an Adidas baseball cap. Uh, you've seen it suspiciously in the bridge just before midnight on Wednesday night. Uh, Fiona Lampin is our correspondent on the scene. Um, Fiona, morning. Just give us the latest, what more do we know about the suspect and indeed what was inside those suitcases? Yes, um, good morning. I'm actually overlooking Bristol's very well known suspension bridge. There's some joggers, some cars trickling over this morning uh, because overnight it has um, reopened. But this is the second day now into uh, the manhunt. All day yesterday the bridge was closed. A white forensic tent was erected on the bridge. Uh, the side towards uh, Lee Woods um, and the police gave a press conference yesterday afternoon and they told us that just before midnight on Wednesday, police were called uh, after a man was seen acting suspiciously on the bridge. They arrived within 10 minutes. By the time the police got here on uh, Wednesday evening, the man had disappeared, but there were two suitcases um, and when they opened up the suitcases, police informed us that shockingly they contained human rem human remains but the man had disappeared. We were told that he'd been brought up to the bridge by a taxi. Uh, the taxi had been held as an, and the taxi driver was helping police um, with inquiries. So yes, we are now into day two of the manhunt. Um, there's cameras all over the suspension bridge. Uh, so they have a very clear, police have a very clear image, which they have released, of a man who has a beard, as you say, wearing an Adidas cap. He's got a, a gold earring, um, and police say, do not approach him. Uh, if you see him, call 999. Uh, yesterday they told us they are carrying out a uh, post-mortem. They wouldn't confirm uh, 
uh, the identity obviously they don't know yet but they didn't know um, if, if we asked how many you know was it one one body they just couldn't confirm anything so we're hoping today that as those um, christmas results come back we will find out just a little bit more uh, about the victim and have you found you spoke to any eyewitnesses really about what they might have seen or what they Yes, yesterday I spoke to uh, a student, um, he's at Bristol University, called Reese White, uh, Wright, and he had been uh, out on a walk on Wednesday with his girlfriend, they were walking from the Clifton side of the bridge over um, to the leeward, leeward side, and um, they first of all sort of saw a commotion with a cyclist um, having an argument with, with someone, and uh, they later realised that that was actually um, a cyclist trying to stop the man escaping. And then they realised um, that they'd seen the suitcases they described, one of them was being silver, um, and they talked about the uh, smell coming from the suitcases. But obviously, you know, Houston is, is, a, very, is a very sort of smart suburb, but it took a while for them to realise exactly what they were seeing. Kelly Lamin in Bristol for us. Good talk to you. Thank you. It is what is it? 18 minutes to 7, that's all of the papers. And um, well, some rather good economic news if you see on the front page of the Financial Times. Sterling surges as GDP data boys Labour's growth agenda is the headline. So this is the news that Sterling has risen to its highest level against the dollar in a year. And although reported under the previous Conservative government, the NFT says, the positive data provides an early boost for the new Labour government, which has declared growth its national mission. And they have a, a, an interview with the head of foreign exchange at the bank, UBS, who says the UK now has arguably the most stable government in the G7 over the next five years, so Sterling should finally see the tide of structural flows move in its favour for the first time in the post-Brexit voting era. Plenty of front pages uh, animated by what's going on in Britain's prisons, so the Daily Telegraph, violent prisoners will be free earlier, that's what we were just discussing a moment ago with Seema Kotecha, the Times front page, Prisoners to be freed after 40% of sentences, thousands of prisoners have been released with their jails running out of cells for weeks. The mayor's got a more sceptical line about the Labour plan. It says Labour could use sort of scare tactics to bring off the jails. One of perhaps in all order in the weeks is to 20,000 inmates are set for early release to free themselves. And the other person just pictured on different pages uh, and profiled in many inside pages is Ollie Watkins, scorer of that Wigginson Colgate. Now, as it turns out, he's a family man, two kids. Uh, pictured with his uh, wife, Ellie Anderson, uh, Alderson, sorry, Ellie Alderson, um, and his mum as well. And uh, it's all this morning in There are less money than happy on the local back benches, according to the eye, when it comes to Pierre Starmer and uh, a mutiny that he faces, as according to their main story on child benefit. Um, the Prime Minister facing the threat of his first Commons rebellion, the eye says, as Labour back benches gear up to force a vote on the two child benefit camp. Uh, Labour rebels hoping to bounce it here into a concession over the benefit cap by pushing for a King's speech vote on the issue next week as opposition parties consider whether to back back in. Our main headline at 16 minutes to 7, President Biden has sought to dismiss concerns about his age and mental fitness, but his first son of news conference in months was blighted by at least a couple of uh, gaps. The BBC honours Dr Michael Mosley across radio and television today and encourages audiences to do just one thing, to improve their own well-being. Um, when we asked if any of you would like to pay tribute to him and specifically tell us one thing that he has inspired you to do, plenty replied, including uh, Lucy Lecker, who told us how Michael had helped her with insomnia. I used to struggle with sleep. I used to be overly anxious about getting the precious eight hours of unbroken sleep, which we are all meant to have. And every night going to bed was like entering the theatre of war and was very stressful not many hours of sleep achieved. Dr. Michael Mosley gently explained to me one special thing. You don't have to get those hours of sleep in one go. If you wake up in the middle of the night, it's okay. Don't panic, just keep resting. You can read or listen to the radio, and when you get back to sleep, it all counts. This changed my battle with sleep, and I think it changed my life just a bit. Thank you so much, Dr. Michael Mosley. What a man, we all miss him so much. Michael Mosley was also a keen advocate of the benefits of swimming, something that changed the life of Frank. Michael Mosley changed my life. 
About 10 months ago, I listened to an episode of Just One Thing where he recommended swimming three times a week. I have been following his advice. After six months, my GP told me to halve the dosage of a drug that I had been taking for about 10 years to maintain a low resting heart rate as part of the treatment for my high blood pressure. After another three months, she told me she was halving the dose again as my heart rate was at the lower end of the spectrum. There have been several other benefits, not least of which is that keeping to the regimen of regular swimming has given me a discipline that was lacking in my life. And the broadcaster and a friend of Michael Wesley, Chris Matton, who described Michael as a mentor. Over many years, Michael had a big influence on my career, on the way I broadcast, and he was a, he was a mentor. He, he, I mean, he gave me a job on presenting Trust Me, I'm a Doctor, and, and has really affected the way I approach radio and television. But I also really enjoyed him as a consumer, um, not as a, a doctor or a broadcaster. And his Just One Thing series, I suppose lots of them I've absorbed into my life, planking I do you know every single day um, and knowing that Michael had signed off each of these tips and you know I trusted him to have looked at the evidence has made me much more able to engage with them but the one thing there was a really lovely episode quite a recent one where he made um, Claire his wife a cup of uh, coffee in the morning at the beginning and it was a very simple dry bit of presenting um, but uh, he talked about the benefits of kindness and I think that's really stuck with me. I do make my wife coffee most mornings. Um, but the idea of being kind, of not in increasing the stress, inflammation and physical and mental damage that so many people are suffering, uh, not doing anything myself to, to, to increase that in the world, just felt like a very resonant piece of advice, particularly at the moment. And so I try and do that my broadcasting as a doctor and you know mainly I guess at home I try and be a bit kind to my wife and my, my three children. Well I've been talking to uh, Michael Wesley's wife Claire who has heard the tributes here and indeed others as well uh, and plenty of letters that she has received. She told me the response has been incredible. I'm still under breath taken by the response from people around the country, across the world, and it's just extraordinary. And, you know, he was quite a sort of quiet, humble man to have that sort of response is just extraordinary. And I hope we can find some really positive changes going forward. And you can hear the full interview with Dr. Claire Bailey, who's been at the top of It's 11 minutes to 7. In a world first, a research farm in Scotland is rearing cattle with no methane emissions. Sort of. It's a project called Green Shed, and a 50 strong herd is being reared in a gas type barn in Scotland where all the methane that they emit will be captured along with their bedding and dung that provides energy for a combined heat and power plant. You may be aware that methane traps more heat in the atmosphere per molecule, a lot more heat than CO2, so it causes greenhouse gas emissions. Well, Tom Heap is the presenter of BBC Radio 4's Rare Earth, which has been looking at this, uh, and visited the facilities and is on. The line now, Tom. Morning. So they're not methane-free in the sense that they um, don't produce any methane themselves biologically. They're more methane-free in the sense that we contain that methane uh, by making sort of it, uh, giving them a sealed environment. Yeah, right. But, you know, when it comes to our concerns about uh, meat, particularly beef in the environment, uh, methane is really top of the charge sheet because, as you said, it is such a potent greenhouse gas, and so. A system that allows uh, cows to live and grow whilst ke keeping methane from reaching the atmosphere is, is a significant milestone. And we got the first look at this system actually up and running for, for rare earth. In some ways it's quite simple. It's a sort of glorified uh, plastic bag with an air handling system that you can put over a shed. Um, but that simplicity I think is part of its strength because it can be retrofitted onto existing sheds. These these sort of plastic walls are a bit like those heavy plasticized curtains you often see on the side of trucks. Um, and then you combine that with an effect an air conditioning system, a bit like we'd have in a, in a human occupied building. And um, 
you have to keep ventilation. Cattle need ventilation. So you can't seal it in the sense of stopping fresh air getting in, but you can then capture the methane, put that into the system. And actually some of the heat and power from that system is also going to run a, a polytunnel uh, for veg production in, once again, in a way that isn't taking uh, energy from the, from the grid or indeed emitting less, uh, less, less gases to the atmosphere. Is it fantastically expensive though, Tom? Because to, to, as you say, to let the fresh air in but capture the methane does require quite sophisticated technology. And on a real, I mean, given the number of cows that are slaughtered every day uh, to provide the world's beef, is this sort of really scalable commercially given that cost? But it's got a lot of uh, money uh, up front. I mean, they they built this from scratch: the the, the, the barn, the curtains, the polytunnel, the, the CHP plant. It has an anaerobic digester because it has to process the muck as well that comes off the cattle to stop gas escaping from that. They got a grant of three million pounds for this system, but they believe that this can be fitted in on, on other farms. Yes, you know, tens of thousands up front, but you do save on energy costs. Uh, and, and and that is something that would, would pay back in there, as well as reducing the uh, carbon equivalent, the carbon emission, emissions, or carbon equivalent emissions, I should say, from, from cattle. And I think one of the interesting things is we're moving into a world where more and more um, retailers and processors are trying to look for low climate impact yes. in their supplies. So if they start you know, encouraging or demanding this from farmers, it could be a change. One of the things that does worry some people is this, as you said at the beginning, is a way of capturing cattle from methane that are housed. Is this going to encourage more cattle to spend more of their lives in barns and less of their lives skipping around the field? <laughs> which some people think the latter is better for welfare. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Tom Heap, uh, presenter of Rare Earth. That particular episode is called The Future of Meat. It's on today just after 12 o'clock. Tom, good to talk to you. Thank you. Seven minutes to seven is the time. We turn now to an extraordinary story that has ended up um, very pleasantly for the person at the centre of it. A retired shopkeeper who was told he was not British, despite living in the UK for nearly 50 years, can stay for good. The Home Office has decided in a U-turn. So this is Nelson Chardet he's from Wallace and Wirral. He's lived in Britain since arriving here as a student in 1977. But in 2019, uh, he was told he had no right to live here. He was originally from Ghana. Uh, he's now being granted that indefinite right to remain after the government says his case is exceptional. So the case is this. He arrived in the UK on a student visa. There was a coup in Ghana, uh, so his family weren't able to pay his fees. He stayed. He took on uh, various jobs, um, married a woman here. Uh, eventually running a news agent in Wallasey called Nelson's News uh, and during the running of that news agent, by the way, given him a police award for bravery after tackling uh, a robber who was attacking a delivery man with a baseball bat. Anyway, Nelson Sade can now stay in Britain and I'm delighted to say is on the line now. Good morning to you. Good morning. This must be, uh, to put it mildly, considerable relief. Oh yes, very, very relief. Because uh, what Nelson went through is really <coughs> damaging. Yeah, and everyone can imagine that. So when you originally heard that the Home Office was saying you were not British, what was your reaction and the reaction of your family? To me, I was shocked because I, I've done everything that anybody has can do to world me the status. So when they told me I'm not a British now, I couldn't believe it. And to be honest with you, I did not uh, pass it on to my children, but I always try to bottle things like this away from my children, not to be worried about me. Really? You didn't tell them? You didn't tell your wider family? I didn't tell my children that uh, I'm messing it to my partner at the time. Mm. Uh, and when you did eventually make public what was happening, there was an extraordinary outpouring, wasn't there, of, of support from you, including from people you didn't know. And there was a huge support from all over the world and, um, and donating money and best wishes. And that's really, really you know, make me 
believe that human nature is kind to people who believe in fairness and justice. And what do you think now of the Home Office's final decision? I really hope they will consider that 10 year road uh, scale. It is really damaging to human beings if like me. So Yeah, this is just to make it clear now, so that this this is the ten year scheme that they suggested you went on where you have to make do all sorts of proofs and stay for a certain amount of time in order to, to prove that you're British. That's correct. You have to re be renewing your uh, visa for every two, two and a half years, and it will be the, the fifth one that will make you complete the 10 year rule before you can apply uh, for your know, citizenship. And that also will be subject to interview. And if you don't pass that, you will start, you, you start the game. Nelson Shade, uh, it has all ended up. In the end, for you, very well. Although my goodness, it must have been been quite a toll at the time that it was all uh, happening. Nelson Shade, thank you so much for talking to us this morning. Three minutes to seven and two Syracuse Lucas for the weather. Thanks, Amol. Well, a fairly grey, cloudy day out there today, with a rather cool northerly breeze around too. Southeast of England starts with quite a lot of rain, particularly so for parts of Kent and Sussex. That should ease away over the next few hours. Southwest of England today, we'll see some sunny spells developing, but also a few heavy and thundery showers this afternoon, particularly close to the south coast and the Lee Channel Islands too. But for the rest of England, away from the south, and for Wales and Northern Ireland, it is going to be a fairly cloudy story. On and off outbreaks of light, patchy rain or drizzle coming and going through the day, certainly not a washout, some brighter spells developing at times, especially later on this afternoon. But for Scotland today, a fair amount of dry weather here, best of the sunshine will be for central and southern Scotland. It'll be cloudier further north with some rain up towards the western Isles. Now temperatures for most of us across the UK somewhere between 17 to 20 degrees but around the north and the east coast where you're exposed to that breeze only about 13 to 15 today. And into the weekend then the north and northeast of the UK generally keeps more cloud through the weekend with some showery rain. Further towards the south and the southwest that's where we'll see a bit more sunshine particularly by Sunday when things will eventually turn a little bit warmer. Sarah, thank you. Uh, as we've been saying all day today, we are celebrating the legacy of Michael Mose. I'm Nita Bilal Small, and I was Michael Mosley's producer on Just One Thing for three years. I think Michael's legacy was making health and well-being fun and light and entirely doable. He really cared about public health, and he cared about people taking charge of their health and of their well-being. If you were going to try just one thing to improve your mental and physical well-being, what should it be? To celebrate Michael Mosley, join us today for Just One Thing Day at Cross Radio 4 and the BBC. You heard, you heard a bit of a uh, justice interview with Dr. Claire Bailey Mosley, wife of Michael Mosley. Uh, you can hear that in full at half past seven. It's very moving indeed. Uh, also next hour, did President Biden do enough to allay the fears of senior Democrats about his mental uh, cognitive ability? Divers go back to the wreck of the Titanic and what to do about Britain's prisons. That's front page news and we're going to be talking to people who have some ideas on how to solve it. You're listening to Today on Radio 4 with Noel Marjan and Justin May. It's 7 o'clock on Friday the 12th of July. The headlines this morning. President Biden has dismissed concerns about his re-election campaign in what was billed a make-or-break news conference, but his defiance was marred by two embarrassing gaps. The government is set to set out emergency plans to reduce overcrowding in prisons in England and Wales, including the early release of some offenders. And the number of complaints about banking services is at its highest level in 10 years. This morning's is this morning by James Steele. President Biden has insisted he remains mentally sharp enough to run for re-election, despite mistakenly introducing Ukraine's leader as President Putin at the NATO summit in Washington before correcting himself. At a subsequent news conference, his first without a script in eight months, he made a defiant defense of his candidacy, but not before making a further gaffe. Our North America editor Sarah Smith was listening. It was an unfortunate start to an event at which President Biden was under intense scrutiny when he got the name of his own vice president, Kamala Harris, wrong. 
I wouldn't have picked Vice President Trump to be Vice President, but I think she's not qualified to be President. Earlier, world leaders at the NATO summit had cringed when Mr. Biden introduced a key European ally as his sworn enemy. And now I want to hand it over to the President of Ukraine, who has as much courage as he has determination. Ladies and gentlemen, President Putin. President Putin. He's going to beat President Putin. President Zelensky. I'm so focused on beating Putin, we got to worry about it. Anyway. However, these were Mr. Biden's only obvious mistakes. Over the best part of an hour in his unscripted news conference, he confidently discussed the conflicts in Ukraine and Gaza, as well as economic policy and his own election prospects, stressing to reporters the virtues of his age and experience. The only thing age does is help you create some little bit of wisdom if you pay attention. He made it clear he has no intention of pulling out of the presidential race, despite repeated questions about his fitness for office, and there was nothing in this performance that would force him to change his mind. But after the event, more members of Congress said they thought he should step aside, indicating this issue will continue to dog Mr. Biden as he campaigns for re-election. President Zelensky cancelled the planned news conference in the wake of Joe Biden's gaffe at the NATO summit. The French President Emmanuel Macron said it had been a slip of the tongue and insisted his American counterpart had been on top of matters at the gathering. Sakir Starmer also defended President Biden, as our political editor Chris Mason reports from Washington. Sakir Starmer concluded this first overseas visit as Prime Minister by saying the alternative to Ukraine's victory was unthinkable. But the issue that is dominating the national conversation in America, President Biden's future, was catapulted to prominence again here when the 81-year-old confused the leaders of Ukraine and Russia just moments before the Prime Minister's own news conference. What follows? Question after question about President Biden. Here is what I asked. Is it not reasonable that some might feel anxious, some might feel scared? that the President of the United States could make a mistake like this. Well, I would urge everyone to look at the substance of what's been achieved over these two days. We have a bigger NATO, more countries. We have a stronger NATO. And President Biden led through all of that. Sakir stuck to this formulation repeatedly. NATO's attempt to project a united, steadfast alliance its members can believe in shaken by yet another wobbly moment from the leader of its most powerful member. The Justice Secretary Shabana Mahmood will today announce emergency measures to deal with a lack of capacity in prisons in England and Wales. The plans will involve some prisoners leaving jail before the automatic release point of halfway through their 